Okay, let's get started. Um, we are very happy to have our next speaker, Marie Pelot. Um, she's an associate professor at the University of Nice Sophia Antipolis. And Marie has worked um, a lot on the domain of solving mixed discrete continuous constraint programming um, problems. And especially has, she has been working a lot on the absolute solver. She's the main developer for the solver that um, works on abstract interpretations to solve these type of problems. And I'm really looking forward to her talk on continuous constraint solving. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for inviting me, and thanks uh, all of the masterclass uh, organizer. I'm very uh, happy to do this talk, and I hope you will enjoy it. So, I will cut my video to be sure uh, for the uh, if you don't have a good internet at home, so or at work. I don't know where you are. So, I'm Marie Pello, and so I will talk about uh, continuous constraint solving. So. Um, how does it work in CP? Uh, you have a constraint satisfaction problem. So you have a, a set of variables, a set of domains that are the value that can be taken by the variables and a set of constraints. So for example, here you have um, a CSP, a problem with two variables, V1 and V2, that can take the values um, between minus 1 and 14 for v1 and minus 5 and 10 for v2 and it's represented by a box in green and you have two constraints uh, the pink one and the blue one okay and so uh, in constraints what you want is the constraint um, the intersection of both constraints and so if you are in discrete in discrete um, constraint solving you can compute the exact solution, which is an instantiation of the variables. So here it's represented by the dots. And when you are um, in continuous, uh, exact solution can be too expensive to compute because there's an infinite uh, number of them or can be intractable. And so um, to solve this problem, you, you will have to be able to represent uh, your variables first. So when you are in the discrete case, you will have a set of values or a range of values to represent your domain. And on continuous, you will have intervals. Uh, when you're on the discrete side, you can compute the exact solution and your solution set is a set of solution. When you are on continuous, you will have to approximate the solution because you cannot compute them exactly. Um, and so an approximate solution is a box that only contains solutions or is small enough with uh, respect to a parameter. And so your solution set will be a set of boxes. So let's see how it works. So it relies on interval arithmetics. So you will define all the usual arithmetic operators on intervals and also set operations, how to intersect or to the union on two intervals. I will not um, state them all, um, but something that you had to know is that to evaluate a constraint, for instance, I've got two variables x and y, and I've got a constraint to x minus y is equal to zero. To know if this constraint can be satisfied, what we do is that we replace all the variables by their domain. And by applying our, uh, interval arithmetics, I will compute uh, the resulting interval. And the only thing that I can say is that if zero belongs to the resulting interval, then there might be a solution, because here it's equal to zero with respect to my constraint. The only thing that I can say for sure is that if zero does not belong to the resulting interval, then there's no solution. So that's the only thing that I can be sure of. And so that's pretty easy to compute, and, but there's limits. For instance, x minus x will never be equal to zero, even though we know it's zero, because we lose correlation between the uh, multiple occurrences of the same variables and of the same variable and of course and 
uh, it depends also of the formulation. For instance, here you've got x squared minus x and x times x minus one. So that's the same constraint, but you don't have the same resulting interval because you, again, you lose uh, some correlation between the variables. And, and so uh, that's some problem <laughs> also. So how does it work? So when you want to solve a C CSP problem, uh, you will use the constraint to propag to delete from the domains the value that cannot be part of solution. That is called the propagation. So that, that does not depend on whether your variables are discrete or continuous. And we use for that something called the consistency. So given a constraint and the domains, we say that they are consistent if there exists no value that cannot be part of a solution. Okay. And once that the propagation is done, you go to the exploration step that depends on the search strategies. So let's focus first on the consistency. So you've got uh, plenty of um, consistencies uh, depending whether you are discrete or continuous. Okay. So I list here some of them. So you might know them, I think if you study constraint programming. And um, in continuous con consistency, we'll focus on whole consistency, but there's others that can exist. And so what it does is that it's trying to compute the smallest box containing the solution and remove all the non-solution. And to do so, it relies on an algorithm called HC4 revise that will uh, first build a syntactic tree of your constraint. So here, for instance, we have the constraint V1 minus nine square plus V2 square is less than 25. So this is represented by this syntactic tree. And you will label the node corresponding to variables with their domain, with their interval. And then you will propagate this information from the leaf to the root using the interval arithmetics. And once uh, you reach um, the root, you will use uh, the other side to uh, reduce potentially uh, the, the, um, the interval. So here at the top left, you add zero to thousand and has on the right side, I've got 25. I know that it cannot be bigger than 25. And then using inverse uh, operator of in the interval arithmetic, I will propagate this information from the root to the leaves. And this algorithm ach achieves uh, L consistency only under certain conditions. So you return the smallest box containing only the solution uh, under certain condition only. Uh, unfortunately, it's not perfect, but it's nice. And something uh, funny about it is that this uh, algorithm has been independently defined uh, in abstract in interpretation and of a research area under the name bottom up, top down, because this is what it go does, goes from bottom to up, then top to down in 2004, as in CP, it was defined in 1999. And so once uh, you've got uh, the consistency for one constraint, you will have to do that for all the constraints. And this is called the propagation loop. And uh, you will apply your consistency until it reaches a fixed point. And of course, at each iteration, you will not propagate all the constraints, but only the one in which one variable has been modified and the order in which you apply your consistency can change the number of operation you would have to apply. And designing an efficient propagation loop is still a challenge if you're interested in, in finding a way to do that uh, in the minimum number of iteration. And so in, in continuous, of course, it does the same and it's called HC4 for L consistency. And starting with always the, with the same example, so you have the green box, 
And first we will consider only the blue constraints and it will reduce uh, the variable V1, for instance, here. And now my box is consistent with the blue constraint. Okay, so I cannot reduce more the box because I will lose some solutions. And now I iterate by doing the same with the pink constraint and it reduces a bit. So I have to iterate again for the blue and then again for the pink and there's no more change. So I reach my fixed point. And so HG4 is generally fast, but it doesn't uh, necessarily return the smallest boxes. Here we can see it's not the smallest boxes containing all the solution, but it's a small enough box, we'll say. It's a good enough uh, algorithm. And so once uh, you've got uh, your, your smallest box, it's not enough to solve the problem. And so the second part is the exploration in the solving algorithm. And this depends on your search strategies. So for instance, when you are in, in the discrete case, so when your variables are discrete, you can enumerate them, you've got different um, choice variables. So you can choose the, the variable with the smallest domain, that is first fail, or depending on the domain and the number of constraints it's part of, so dumb deg, dumb other the deg, or dumb w deg. So, and once you've choose which variable you're gonna branch on, you have to choose the value that you're gonna assign to it. And so again, there's multiple uh, choices. And that's the same in continuous. So in continuous constraint solving, you will have first your choice variable, and you've got for instance largest first, so you will choose the variable with the biggest domain, uh, round robin, robin that will choose the variable once after the other, or max mir for instance, that will choose the variable maximizing um, depending of the um, uh, Jacobian matrix of your constraints. Yeah. And on, once you've choose which variable you're gonna branch on, then you've got way less choice. And usually what you do is gonna split a box in two. Uh, recently there have been some work on trying to find other value choice uh, strategies, but there's not uh, very conclusive, but there's a lot of work here if you want to try <laughs> and see if some of the discrete uh, uh, strategies can be applied to the continuous if you want to. And so once uh, you've chose your variable, usually we're gonna, gonna split it in two. So how does it work? So you've got uh, your, the algorithm on the, on the left side and on the right side, the example. So first we start with our domain, the big uh, green box. And then we apply the consistency as we saw it uh, earlier, but you can use another consistency if you like that here, it will be the other consistency. And then if it's not, um, it does not contain, if the box does not contain only solution, or it's not small enough with respect to our parameter R, uh, then this box is split into two boxes and we apply this algorithm again on those two boxes. So we're going to reduce them and then split them. And we stop, the algorithm stops when all the boxes only contain solution, like the one in the middle here, that's a box containing only solution and we're sure of that. Our boxes are uh, small enough, and that's the one on the border. So there might be no solution in them, but uh, they are small enough. And so uh, to synthesize, how does it, uh, CP uh, does not take into account the correlation of the variables here. The correlation between the variables are the, relation, are the constraints, sort of. But on the domain, 
they do not uh, take into account that. And so you, you will usually have Cartesian project uh, to represent your variables. And it does not um, easily mix uh, discrete and continuous uh, variables inside the same problem, okay? So usually there's some solvers that, that try that. For instance, uh, Shoko with Ibex, they try to mix um, the two in order to solve mixed discrete continuous problems. Uh, but there are very few, like real Peaver also try to um, uh, mix both. But it's not uh, really conclusive. You, you usually use MIP for that. But something good is that uh, CP offers a framework to model many combinatorial problems and solve um, problems either on discrete or continuous domain and has a various heuristic to improve the solving methods. And with all those heuristics, it uh, efficiently, efficiently solves many combinatorial problems. And a remark about uh, mostly continuous is that uh, it computes another approximation of a solution set. And another uh, research area in which we compute other approximations of solution set, it's abstract interpretation. So abstract interpretation, I will call it ANTAPS um, for short, because I cannot use AI, it's too ambiguous, uh, is a theory of approximation of the semantics that has been defined in 1976. And it's applied uh, to static analysis and verification of so software. And the, one of the goal is to automatically prove that the program does not have execution errors. So what's, that's one of their main um, problem to do. And to do that, they study the variables values. Okay, so let's say we've got this toy uh, program on the left. So you have uh, two variable x and y, and, and then you have a loop. So let's assume that we have a forbidden zone. So y cannot be greater than x plus 3, for instance. So we got this um, a forbidden zone. So how does it work? Is that it will st study all the possible values taken by, by my variables. So for instance, at the beginning, y takes one, and x is between one and five. So all my environment uh, for my two variables are the uh, purple dots. So, and then you go inside the loop because it, uh, the, it satisfied the condition of my loop. And by applying the, all the instruction of my problem, at the end, I got all the purple dots representing my possible assignment for both variables. And so what we want is to compute all those dots. It's called the concrete domain. But computing it is, can be undecidable, undecidable or too expensive. And so to do so, they will uh, abstract those values and use uh, abstract domains. So here, for instance, if we use the intervals, at first, um, y is equal to one and x can be um, everywhere. And once x is a sign, we have a better bound on my x um, by values and as the condition is satisfied, we will go inside the loop and by, repeat, by iterating all those, we obtain in the end this um, box, uh, this abstract domain. And it's a good abstract domain because it's uh, sound. It contains all the concrete domain, okay? But here we have a false alarm that we will say that the problem, the program uh, goes into the forbidden zone because my box intersects with my forbidden zone. And even if I had the best operator to compute the smallest abstract domain here, 
the, um, the smallest abstract element, I will still have my false alarm. And so what they do in abstract interpretation when they have um, so a problem like that, instead of splitting like we do, they change the abstract representation. And so they will have uh, zones, octagons, or polyhedra. So if they, they are not precise enough, they will choose another abstract representation, an abstract, abstract domain. And of course, there's a trade-off between the expressivity and the cost of computing uh, my abstract element, because the less precise they are, the cheaper they are. Of course, computing with polyhedra will be uh, more costly than computing with an interval. And so in CP, we have uh, a solving method that iterates by reducing and branching and by making choice and branching on them. Uh, and domains representation uh, makes the solving method type dependent. And what we, we want, we're gonna try, is to abstract the representation. And so for that, uh, we're gonna rely on what exists in untaps. So in abstract interpretation, they've got various abstract domains that come with a, a lot of operators. Um, and so what we need, if we want to use them in CP, is to be able to have a consistency on them, that is to reduce uh, to the, and then delete all the parts that are non-solution. We will have to be able to split them uh, if, if we want to solve, use them in the continuous solving method, and also to be able to have a precision function or to be able to say if it's small enough with respect to my parameter R, because this is how it works in CP or the continuous part. And so that's what we did. Uh, so it was pretty easy in the end because uh, using only the function that already existed in abstract interpretation, we were able to uh, define the propagation and the exploration also. And so, um, and something nice about those abstract domains is that can, you can mix them also. So I can represent them, um, I can use and first solve with a polyhedra a polyhedron and solve my problem with a box in parallel, for instance, and then using the reduce product, as they call it, I can communicate the information from one abstract element to the other in order to reduce and have a better approximation of my solution. And so using that, we were, we starting from the continuous solving method, we define an abstract solving method. Um, so there was uh, everywhere that it's box related, we uh, delayed that part and now we abstract it using the abstract domain. And relying on the operation that already exists, we were able to define a new solving method. And so this was uh, implemented in a solver. And so the first release that was made that is available on OPAM uh, rely on APRON, which is a library of uh, numerical abstract domains. And uh, we use uh, what was already inside um, the library to define the consistency the propagation loop. So for, um, so for instance here, we propagate all the pro constraints at it is iteration, which is not very nice. And this will be uh, is still to improve if someone wants to work with me on that. <laughs> and uh, for the splitting operator, it has to be defined for each abstract domain. There was no generic way of doing that. And so if you're interested, there's uh, uh, the code on GitHub. 
and um, we're going to do a refactoring uh, soon and release a new version. Um, and so, for instance, this is uh, um, a difference between the different solving method that you will have in absolute. So, using only the boxes, like uh, it's usually done in constraint programming, using um, octagons, or using uh, mixed uh, domains, so boxes and polyhedra and octagons. Uh, so inside you will have the boxes and on this border you will have uh, octagons to try to improve the, the, the approximations. And something that was uh, published in CP in 2018 is uh, to guide also the exploration using the consistency. So uh, the idea was uh, once you use the consistency, you can have a box uh, containing all your solution. And we apply also the consistency on the negation of my constraints. And so now I've got a box uh, appro um, approximating the set of non-solution. And so what we can say is that what's inside the box but not inside the non-solution are solution for sure. And what's at the intersection, what's in the non-solution but not in my box is non-solution for sure. And what's inside the intersection is unknown. Okay, and based on that, uh, you've got a new solving method that will uh, propagate as usual. And if it's not small enough or does not contain only solution, what it does is that it will um, approximate the non-solution and it will say for sure, all the parts of the box that are not, not solution are solutions. And so the search we will will continue only on those uh, two boxes. And then you will have to keep on exploring. So split those two boxes and keep on searching like that, using the propagation to reduce and the non-solution to try to reduce again that box. And with that, we obtained very nice uh, drawing in TigZ. So you can see on the left is without the exploration and on the right with the exploration. So you will have less branching, of course, with a cost of computing the non-solution and the intersections, but uh, you will uh, have bigger box uh, containing solutions uh, and less boxes in the end for the same solution. Again, uh, some more drawings with uh, some other problems. You can solve also trigonometric problems and 3D problems. Uh, you have those um, uh, in the server. And so uh, with, uh, to conclude, uh, with this server, we proved that uh, a CP solving method can be defined using abstract interpretation tools and techniques. And it's modular because it, it depends only on the abstract domain, but you can switch abstract domains, of course, with a cost on computation. And uh, it handles naturally mixed constraints problem because um, in a program, uh, you will have both floats and ins. So the abstract domain deal with the mix themselves. And, uh, but you need to implement um, uh, they still need to implement advanced CP heuristics in absolute uh, because for the moment it's very poor on that side. And so uh, if you're interested in working on that, uh, you can um, try to add some more CP heuristics and techniques like specialized propagators and improve the propagation loop, uh, develop new abstract domains if you have a specific constraint for instance, like uh, an ellipse abstract domain, also on the top. Um, uh, 
and use uh, and something that will be nice also is to do the inverse so that use CP methods to help with uh, uh, static analyzers uh, to prove correctness or, or to prove uh, that there's no error in the in the execution of a code and something I did not talk about but if you're interested this will be very nice it's to use the widening operators that is defined in absolute partition in a CP solver. So thanks for your attention. If you have uh, questions, uh, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you very much, Marie. This was a very interesting talk. I, I certainly learned a lot and we already have a, some questions coming in. So the first question is from Emmanuel and he asks, what's the rationale for largest first Maybe What's Manuel, the? Want, sorry? Uh, I, I didn't hear. Um, sorry, um, the question is what's the rationale for largest first? Oh, it's because you want to stop when the small, the box is small enough with respect to your parameter R. So by splitting the largest interval first, then you will reach faster a smaller box. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question from Michael, and he says in standard finite domain CP solvers, a key feature, oops, I just lost it, a key feature simplifying implementation is that variables are independent. So is this independence um, for inter interval variables? Well, oh, sorry, I cannot do this properly. So this independence for Interval variables naturally gives the orthogonal boxes. So using abstract domains, do we need to represent these variables collectively or do we represent the variables? Um, yeah. Just, can you read the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> collect. Yes, of course, uh, the abstract domain will, will uh, represent all the variables collectively. There's no more uh, uh, independence. And so you can... Uh, so for instance, if you have uh, octagonal constraints in your problem, like in, in scheduling and, and problems like that, uh, they will be represented naturally with the abstract domain. Can we have one more question from Emir? Um, the question is about numerical instabilities that you see in mixed integer programming solvers. So, if you have imprecisions in floating point, can there can this cause any infeasible solutions, even though there is there is no infeasibility? Uh, so that that will be the the inverse. So we will not report uh, infeasibility if there exists a solution, but we can say we can report a solution, even though the problem is infeasible. Um, because uh, we will have a, a small enough box and because of um, the, the imprecision of the intervals sometimes you will say there may be a solution in that box but you cannot be sure it exists so that will be the so usually you don't report that it's infeasible if there exists a solution but you can report that there exists a solution but you're not sure. Okay, thanks. I also have a question. So if I understood correctly in abstract interpretation, you have these different shapes that you can choose. Um, how do you decide which shape to choose? Like if you chase oct an octagonal, uh, octagon or something like this? So for the moment in absolute, you will have um, a smaller oracle. So if your constraints is looks like an octagonal constraint, we will use the octagons. And if it's linear, we will use a polyhedra. And if not, we will use the intervals. So depending on your constraints, mm -hmm. you will deal with those constraints with different abstract domains. And using the reduced product, you will mix the information um, between the different uh, abstract elements. And are there certain constraints, numerical constraints, where this is very effective or where it's not effective at all? Um, usually it's quite good 
if you have time. <laughs> I mean, that depends on the time you have. I think I also overlooked the second part of Emir's question, sorry. He also asked if there's some predefined precision, so limiting the size of the smallest box. Oh, yes. Uh, so usually you would put like, uh, most of the solver in continuous, they're like 10 to the power of minus seven, something like that. But you can usually change it. Uh, that's a parameter that you can fix as you wish. But of course it cannot be smaller than the, um, the dimension between two floating points. I also have one more question. So you mentioned at the beginning that the formulation of your constraints has a big impact as well. So do you, do you perform some automated reformulations to increase the correlation between the uh, variables? So we tried um, first, there's a pre-processing trying to reformulate the constraints, but there's no, uh, we tried to do a, a small study about it, but there's no con conclusion uh, behind it, so which formulation is the best? So that depends. So you choose one and you hope for the best. <laughs> but uh, if you have any idea how to find the best reformulation, it will be nice. <laughs> okay, I think those are all questions answered. Thank you again very much for, for your great talk. Let's yeah. all unmute your, our, um, our speakers again and, and clap for Marie. <laughs> Thanks to everyone to participate. And as Maurice said, I hope you will remember the 21st night of September. <laughs>